Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, a nationally ranked community-focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia, Northeast Tennessee, and North Carolina. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Virginia Tech football is coming off the heels of another tough loss, falling to Marshall 24-17 to on the road. With any game, there's some good and some not so good. We'll tell you all about it. It's episode 314 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. record on Monday, September 25th, 2023 from our Tech Sideline studio in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and please share the podcast with a friend. On set today, we have the normal football crew, lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman to my right. Across the way, senior staff writer Andy Bitter. In the fourth chair, managing editor David Cunningham. Producing behind the scenes, Mr. Nick Brown. And I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. As always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. Check out their new Checking with Perks account that comes with cell phone protection, roadside assistance, fuel savings, deals and discounts, and so much more. Visit firstbank.com to learn more about this great new account for students. Gentlemen, 24-17, the final score in Huntington, West Virginia. The Hokies fall to Marshall. Is it panic time? I don't feel any different this week than I did last week. Yeah. So, yeah, so is it that. panic time? I don't know. Were you panicking last week? Was it panic time, I guess? Then. I mean, I don't think tech is good. I mean, do you panic about it? I mean, what can you do at this point? I mean, you just try to get to the end of the season and what, what comes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's the chances of winning our, our, our season goal of six games this year. I think you can go ahead and toss that out the window for sure. Yeah, they've they've lost more than two non-conference games for the first time since 1992. One and three start for the first time since 1991. Um, This was a manageable non-conference portion of the schedule. I mean, you look at some non-conferences and you go, well, that's a loss. You're not going to be able to get past that one. You hope to go three and one or two and two just based on the schedule. I think you looked at this four-game stretch here and go, if you were designing a non-conference schedule for a rebuilding team, I think. It would look pretty similar to what the Hokies had this year. Purdue is not that great, uh, seeing them get exposed by Syracuse or Wisconsin in recent weeks. Rutgers is a fine team, but, you know, go to, to Michigan. Michigan's a great team and, and beat them pretty badly up there. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I'm not going to say Marshall's a bad team. It's a group of five team. And it's, you know, on the better side of group of five teams, but you probably should be beating group of five teams on the road. So to start one and three against that schedule, it doesn't feel like it gives you a lot of hope going into ACC play. Even in an ACC schedule where you caught a lot of breaks this year and don't have Clemson, don't have Duke, North Carolina, um, Miami. You miss those four, four of the top five teams, and it still looks like a pretty tough road ahead. Well, you go ahead and on the first drive, Virginia Tech looked the best they did all season, literally. Uh, went down the field, scored on the opening drive, 31-yard touchdown run from uh, Kyron Drones, looked pretty good in the process of doing so. Shortly thereafter, Kelly Lawson gets that interception, was kind of thrown right to him, but uh, definitely big to come up with that. And then the wheels start to sputter a little bit. You lose the momentum. Um, how do you kind of lose it after having your best start of the year? You know, one of the narratives was – going in this game is why can't Tech get off to a good start? And in this game, they actually got off to a good start. So, like, I picked the game 24-20 Marshall. It was 24-17. So it was Chris knows pretty, all. pretty much what the end result I expected, but we just took a totally different route to get there. And I think, uh, I don't know, I just think Tech came out running the football with those two long running plays. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into this later. I don't think they, they ran it as much as they should, considering the success that they were having. And, uh, you know, I think I think Marshall's just a better football team. And over the over the course of a, uh, gosh, a game that has 130, 140 plays, generally the best team's going to win. And Marshall's better. And even though Tech got off to a good start, Marshall still had the entire rest of the game to, to show their dominance. Yeah, I think Marshall adjusted a little bit. But I, I, I do think, on your point, Tech got away from the ground game. 
I mean, that first first drive, there was, what, 15.5 yards of carry or something like that. Uh, they were still doing pretty well. I, I know it, it tightened up on the ground, but there was more on the ground than in the air, it seemed like. And they just kind of drifted away for that for, for no reason. I, I looked up some of these stats uh, afterwards. They averaged, Virginia Tech averaged 6.1 yards per carry for the game. And they've done that 35 times since 1987. This was the third fewest carries they've had in a game where they had that but that good of a yard per carry average. Um, so it's kind of inexplicable going away from it that much. And he, even during that stretch in the second and third quarters where they, they you know, I think it was like 3.6 yards a carry, something like that, that was more yards than they were getting when they passed the ball, when you include the sack yardage that they lost. So, uh, you know, when something's working, don't go away from it. It, it seems like they almost outsmarted themselves in some ways. Uh, you know, I know they had that fourth and three that they went for and said kicking a long field goal. I actually like the decision to go for it. I don't like the decision to throw it deep. Uh, into what turned out to be triple coverage, uh, no chance that was getting completed. That but was so bizarre. I, you yeah. know, a lot of people are like, oh, you take the points there. It's like, well, it's not guaranteed three from 48 yards. So I like the decision there. I like the aggressiveness. Maybe may a better play call in that situation, better read by drones wherever he could have gone with the ball. But uh, just kind of big picture and how they were operating offensively, it felt like they went away from something that was working for no reason whatsoever. I think, you know, the most important individual position on the team is the quarterback. And you always have to be able to design your game plan based on your quarterback's strengths and weaknesses. It's pretty obvious what Drones' strengths and weaknesses are. He's very good at running the football, not so advanced as a passer. So I ran the numbers yesterday from his two starts, and neither he nor Wells have enough you know, plays this year to qualify for the statistical leaders or whatever. But like in yards per attempt, Drones is outside the top 100 by a mile. In quarterback rating, he's outside the top 100 by a mile. I mean, this is someone who is not efficient at all in the passing game. So they come out and throw it 35 times with him. He's a very good runner, but he's got 15 carries, five of which were sacks. A few of those were scrambles, too. So, it's so yeah, that Tech uh, ran it 30 times, and they threw it 35 times. But you throw in the sacks and then a couple, two or three scrambles, then you're really talking about 42, 43 called passing plays in this game and about you know, 22 or 23 called running plays. That just seems to be the opposite of what you should be doing when your quarterback, his strength is running and his weakness is passing. Going back to that, that stats about over six yards of carry, there were five games over since 87 uh, where they had 34 carries or fewer, fewer than 34 carries. Two of them were complete blowouts, so it didn't matter in those games. Three of the losses, Marshall this year, Liberty in 2010, 6.5 yards a carry, Kentucky in the bowl game in 2019, 6.6 yards per carry. Okay, you mean like, the J- JMU in 2010 instead of Liberty? You said Liberty. I, 2020. Did I say okay. 2010? Yeah, I okay, mean, so, it, so recently. Okay, okay. Uh, so those you. those three games. Okay. Uh, and those are three pretty heartbreaking losses yeah. that were close for you, like – did they have the best offensive plan if they're running the ball that well and, and, you know, decide to pass it or or don't run it that often. So uh, it it just strikes me as odd that, you know, they've been talking about wanting to be this running team and uh, physical and in the trenches and move the ball, uh, you know, on the ground like that. You finally have some success with it and they went away from it. I know some game circumstances dictated that there was the end of half situations where they, they threw it a bunch in that situation. You know, you get down by two touchdowns late, you're going to have to throw the ball in that situation to get back. But, uh, you know, they weren't down two touchdowns the whole game. Right. That that was a close enough game that you could still run your offense as you had planned. And uh, it just, it it got a little off kilter, the whole thing. I could have understand if they played it that way, if Wells had been the quarterback, but it was the opposite. And so you've got, you got to be able to play your, your player's strength better than that. And, and it's, it's like, I've been saying, it's like, I always said about Wells. It's like, I, I never, blame Wells for the offensive issues. And I don't blame Kyron Drones for the offensive issues because it just doesn't seem like either guy or any player on the offense for that matter, the offense itself is just not being in a put in a good position to succeed. So how can you blame individual players for, for things like that? Like it's Kyron, Kyron Drones did not have an efficient day, but he was asked to throw it 35 times. Like he's the type of quarterback that needs to be in a run first offense and then out of a successful running game, then comes your smoke and mirrors, passing plays and things like that. Kind of how they, you know, ushered in Hendon Hooker exactly. yeah, in 2019. Exactly. And now he became a much better passer mm-hmm. by the end. Different system, different coordinator, mm-hmm. more mature player. But at that stage of his career, that's how they thought he could have the most success. And, you know, they won 
eight games that year. Yep. Probably should have won more yep. at the end of the season, but they turned that season around when they found a way to to play to his strengths. And you brought up the fact of uh, Kyron scrambling. His second touchdown was actually on a scramble. It was on that far side yeah. of the field. Uh, David, you got something in the fourth chair? Yeah. So I was looking at the 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 drives, and one of the nice things that um, the live stats do is they break down the drives by pass plays and yards and rush plays and yards. You go down and look at the average yards per carry on the ground for every Virginia Tech drive. That first drive, Virginia Tech had three rushes for 64 yards. That's an average of 21 yards per rush. Tech on the second drive only ran it one time for two yards. Then it was two times for five yards. Then on the the drive where Tech kicked the field goal and Tech had that obviously long run, two rushes for 50 yards. Now, one of those was a 49-yarder, so it makes sense. But Tech punted, uh, I believe, seven seven straight times, uh, six straight times after that with a fumble. Uh, Tech ran the ball once for seven yards, once for four yards, two for six, one for negative two, and then once it got into late in the third quarter, two for 16 and three for 10. So, yeah, sure, there was a drive or two in, at the beginning of the third quarter where Tech did not run the ball very efficiently. But there was a, a drive at the very end of, of the half, which I understand, where Tech didn't even run the ball at all. Again, situations dictate that. But like Andy said, when you look at the, the average yards per carry – it's it's just baffling the fact that Tech was actually having success on the ground. And this is a question that, that somebody commented on the message boards. Prize talked over and over and over about how we need to establish the ground game. Tech has, you know, uh, 69 yards in the first quarter on the ground. That's the most in like two, three years in the first quarter. And Tech just magically goes away from it? It just it doesn't make any sense. I I I just figure I give some numbers to put into context. But the fact that between after Tech kicked the field goal and Tech's touchdown drive at the end, Tech ran the ball for ten times in seven drives. That I mean yeah. that kind of goes to show you when when Tech passed the ball at least twice, almost four times. On every other drive. Well, something we haven't really brought up yet. Um, it, it feels like big explosive plays are also, a, a, you know, kind of plaguing the Hokies right now. Didn't really give up anything explosive against ODU or Purdue, but huge run for Manungai last week against Rutgers. Now you have uh, a 56 yarder for Rasheen Ali, the tailback for Marshall this week. And it just, it's so demoralizing in so many ways, especially when the game ends fairly close and you have a chance to be in it. Um, and then the offense doesn't have big playability. So you don't have anything to combat it. Kind of break that down for us. Well, 56-yarder and a 61-yarder. Yeah. Uh, I thought where the safety play was lacking against Rutgers, I noticed the linebackers more against Marshall in a bad way. Uh, It was was not a situation where they were playing very well. Uh, That first touchdown Rasheen Ali had, it looked like Alan Tisdale and Will Johnson both went to the same gap, just opened up wide up the middle. He wasn't even touched on his way to the end zone. And then that 61 yarder up the side looks like Will Johnson just couldn't get a hand on him out there. And then he runs right by him, uh, you know, by the end of the game, I, I think Pry was so frustrated with the linebacker play. They put in Jaden McDonald and uh, George balance. I mean, that's your third string linebackers there just because the, the top two groups were not getting it done. And you looked at the grades on PFF. And like we always say, like if it matches what you're seeing with your eyes, maybe it's, it's probably uh, pretty good statistics there. You know, for the, the bottom eight graders who played more than 10 snaps were middle linebackers. You can't have that kind of play and expect to be stopping the run. And it, it seems like it's, it's like whack-a-mole. It's something new each week pops up. It's like safety play is a little bit better. Okay, linebackers struggling. Linebackers struggling. Lines, <laughs> line, linebackers get better. The, the defensive line gets struggling. For some reason, they just cannot put together uh, th- this defensive run-stopping unit. It's just baffling to me because they have, you know, as I, as I wrote, you know, they have basically three linebackers coaches on this staff. I mean, Pry. It, that's his specialty was linebackers when he was at Penn State. Got some really good ones there. Chris Marv played linebacker. Was no SEC linebacker uh, back in his playing days. He's coached at his career. You know, uh, Sean Quinn 
I know he coaches the star position. He's coached linebackers throughout his career. He's been a defensive coordinator, and still that play has just not gone well this year. So it kind of makes you scratch your head about what is the coaching, what is the teaching going on there, because if there's a disconnect between what they're trying to teach and what the players are receiving, and it's a problem week after week, then you got to change up your methods or find some way to get through so that this makes sense and guys are getting the run fits right. Certainly uh, some mental issues. I mean, you talked about two linebackers running to the wrong gap. We saw that the previous week on a, on a long touchdown by Rutgers where two of the safeties ran to the exact same gap. Yeah, and, uh, and you see a player against Purdue who accidentally runs the wrong play because he's reading the wrong signaling guy from the sideline. It's just this team is not mentally focused. And uh, that's, that's an issue because you, when, you, when you start one and three, if any confidence is lost in the coaching staff from the player's standpoint, it becomes harder and harder the more games you lose for the coaches to reestablish that mental focus. I know what it's like to be on a team where nobody has confidence in the coaching staff. As the season goes along, you actually get worse. You focus less. You're just playing to get to the end of the season. And that's the big concern here is that things will actually get worse. They'll spiral out of control because I don't think the fans trust the coaching staff at this point, from what I can tell, at least not the coordinators. And you've been reading the message yeah, boards. Imagine that. Yeah. Twitter? <laughs> I went on on a limb Some there. Very measured yeah. takes on the boards after <laughs> yeah. that game. Um, but like, I'm sure there are players on that team that feel the same way. I don't know which ones or how many, but when you go this, I mean, you're talking, I mean, it's the same thing every game you're getting gouged on the ground and then the offense is bad for the entirety of the Bowen tenure and, you can't blame it on the quarterback anymore because it's a different quarterback now, right? It's it's the same result. And you're just taking a different path. And that's the main concern is that the longer this goes on, they lose confidence and even more they'll make even more mistakes because they just aren't mentally dialed in. It's tough to if you're a coach to preach, you know, we're this is progress and we're getting better and, and over time and when the results are not there. Trust the process. Right. Trust the process. It's like, okay, how can I when the results have been the same? Mm-hmm. And maybe progress is infinitesimal or very tough to see in certain regards. But when you don't have that reward at the end that you're playing better or you're winning games, I feel like that can beat you down a little bit. I do think it's interesting to point out, you mentioned that, I think we should point out that the offense did have some big plays in this game. Like the offense hasn't necessarily had a lot of big plays, but you have tech had four runs of over 20 yards in this game. Tech had none coming in to this Marshall game. Now, as Chris wrote on Sunday, and I thought he put it in, in perspective very well, what you have with Kyron drones on the ground, you lose in the air. What you have with Grant Wells in the air, you lose on the ground. Grant Wells, you know, Tech's longest play from scrimmage this season in the air was 44 yards. That was the longest play until Bayshall Tootin had a 49-yard run. But the craziest thing is, like, yes, Tech's not consistently ripping off big plays, but Tech had five plays of 20 or more yards in this game. And the problem is now the other side, as you pointed out, that, you know, like Andy said, you start to get the ground game going, you start to rip off a couple big plays, and then all of a sudden, uh, another hole opens up. I, I think about it like a like a dam, like when you're trying to plug a dam, it's like you, you plug one hole, and then all of a sudden something else pops, and you have to go plug something else. And it's like, okay, Virginia Tech, two weeks ago at Rutgers, looked like it had the quarterback situation figured out. Okay, but the run defense showed itself. <laughs> And now Kyron Drones and Virginia Tech, they can run the ball on the ground. I mean, Tech had its best rushing performance of the season, but then you go away from the ground game, right? Just three, what, one step forward, three steps back kind of thing? Like it's, and, and when you're already behind the eight ball, that's not productive. Well, you know, we're going to sit here and it's going to be a different thing each week or it is a different thing each week. With exception of the run defense, it's the same that's thing. That's consistent. Yeah, it's consistent. consistent. Um, we can nitpick it all we want, but the bottom line is that it just does not appear to be a well-coordinated football team. And I use that word strategically for a reason. And uh, on either side of the ball, and uh, you could say well-coached, 
you know, it could could be a bigger issue than than the coordinators. Um, I think if you're if you're an old enough Tech fan, you remember after the 1992 season when Frank Beamer changed out both coordinators and some coaches, and things immediately got better. So you could sit here and say, oh, if Pride does that at the end of this year, things have a chance to get a lot better immediately. I mean, you go from two eight and one to nine and three with a couple coordinator changes and a couple other assistant coaches. But the other thing is he did, and he wrote this in his book. He thought there were he thought the program itself he wasn't running it properly. So he called up his mentor, Bobby Ross, and said, what would you recommend I do behind the scenes to make this a better football program? And he he dedicated an entire chapter in his book to like the 20 things Bobby Ross went over, went over with him and said, here's maybe what you want to start doing. And uh, it's, like, it's one of those things, that story never got told until seven years later when Beamer wrote his book. Everybody knew about the coordinator changes, but nobody knows about the behind the scenes discipline stuff, the changes he made in the program, how they did things on a daily basis. I don't know if there's anything wrong there or not. I think there's something wrong with the coordinating and the coaching, but it could be deeper than that. Or it might not be, but that's up to pry. But, but what I'm saying is like, don't just assume that, oh, if, if you change out Bowen, if you change out Marv or whatever other coach you, you want to change out, that doesn't necessarily fix all the problems. Um, and I, I'm not 100% convinced that the program's firing on all cylinders even after the, the, the coordinator issues. Well, Phil Amation is just down the road. Yeah. I think he's available if, if you need is. to bring him in here. And uh, <laughs> he's, from a little, to him, he's, he's a little fiery. From talking to him, he's still got some opinions about stuff. So, I, I mean, he he'll come in and tell you like it is. Uh, maybe he'd be a good, uh, you know, sort of a consultant to bring onto the program and just to, like say, here it is, take a look, give it to us straight, because he will. <laughs> I had some numbers stuff, but right now it just feels like there's a bigger conversation. So I'm going to kind of pivot to some of the big picture stuff that I did have planned for the show today. Um, you know, I had a good conversation yesterday with, with a handful of people, and, and a good point was brought up. First year head coaches have had success before. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, you could go down a laundry list of names. But typically when that happens, they bring in experienced veteran coordinators to back them up. Now, of course, there's exceptions to every rule. You have a first-year head coach, and you have a pair of 34-year-old coordinators, and Tyler Bowen and Chris Marv are both 34 years old, and also slightly inexperienced in comparison um, to a lot of other coordinators across the league, across the country, however you may want to say it. But... Is that the issue? Like, it, it, are they in over their heads? Because it certainly feels that way when you watch week to week, and now you're on year two, and nothing's gotten better, really, besides talent. Uh, obviously, I think a first-year head coach can work. A first-year offensive coordinator can work. A first-year defensive coordinator can work. And I know these guys aren't all first-year now. They were last year. But I, I wonder how many times they're in college football, especially at this highest level of college football. I wonder how many times there's been a first year head coach, first year coordinate and first year coordinators all on the same staff at the same time. That that's got to be few and far between. There's no way to actually go back and research that as far as I know. You could, it would just take a while. It would just take a long time. Yeah. We wouldn't have any other. Maybe I'll find, for maybe like I'll find some months. time this over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Look, yeah look maybe it'd be a summer project or something, but, um, it doesn't appear to be working. Now, I think it's not necessarily that either, any any of those guys is because they're in their first year. I mean, Bud Foster was once a first-year defensive coordinator, right? And guess what? His defense was awesome, and it finished number one in the country against the run, and Tech won the Sugar Bowl. First-year coordinator. Um, Ricky Bussell in 1993, when he was the offensive coordinator, I believe he was a first-year offensive coordinator and got promoted from within. His offense was dominant. Like, in his second game, they put up, like, 600 yards and six – 60 points against Pitt. You know, he was good from the very beginning, first-year coordinator. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the fact that any of these guys are first-year guys. I just think you've either got it or you don't if you're a coordinator. They are young, and maybe they could have used a few more years of seasoning, but, like, it doesn't – like, Bowen, it doesn't – like it doesn't even seem to me like – he's close to being a really effective offensive coordinator. He hasn't shown me anything so far where I can say, yeah, if he just had a, you know maybe a few more years behind it and another experienced offensive guy, guy he'd be okay. It just uh, he doesn't seem to, be, to me to be on that level. Um, there's a lot of inexperience. That doesn't help. Um, I do think they probably need an old head on the staff in one way, shape, or form. I don't know that any, any of the assistants really fit that mold to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think that inexperience is an issue, 
and it's an it's an issue in schemes and X's and O's and things like that. But it's probably it's probably also an issue with just your everyday things in the program, just your little things that fans don't think about or or, or even we don't think about that happen in a football program on a daily basis. And 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 maybe the, the maybe the key guys in leadership positions at Virginia Tech don't really have the experience in their roles to make it through those situations. Yeah, I think when you look at coordinators, like everybody has a great plan going in and it always looks good on paper. You're going to hit sticking points along the way. And what you have when you have veteran coordinators is they've hit those before and they've had an alternate path they can go or they could reach into their bag and, and find some way to motivate or to, to shore up a problem. Uh, I think for Marv and I think for Bowen, they're encountering a lot of this for the first time. These are new situations for them. And they haven't had that experience where, you know, you know Bud for 30 years, obviously different caliber of coordinator, a Hall of Fame level guy, but he would run into a situation where tackling was not great for a couple of weeks. He's like, okay, I know how to fix this. I know how to go in and into practice, hammer it. It's fixed. We'll move on to the next thing. Or they, they'll see something or a motivational thing. that they, they have ways that they know that have worked over time uh, that they can go to that when they have to troubleshoot something. Uh, and I just don't know if these guys necessarily have that. And I don't know how many people there are on the staff that they can go to where that can be the case. I think there's a little more help on the defensive side. You know, Quinn has been around for a while. Former head coach. He's been so. a head coach. He's been a coordinator. Pry, obviously, uh, defensive uh, specialty there that can help out there. I look at the offensive staff, and, you know, that was Brad Glenn and Joe Rudolph last year. You know, I don't think Crook has been a coordinator. Uh, Fontel Mines has been a coordinator. Uh, Brooks, I don't no. believe, has been a coordinator. Holt has maybe sat in. So I don't know if he's had a coordinator title, but he has his hands full doing special teams yeah. regardless. So I just don't know how much help they have on that offensive side to, to troubleshoot some of those situations, and that's – you know, maybe something they need to look into and, and bring in somebody to help along. Certainly help Fuente when Jerry Kill was here and, and another, you know, set of eyes who's been through those things and has, has been through problems and figured them out before. But they don't really seem to have that right now. You remember Tech's uh, best quarter of offense came last year was when the NC State game when they put Glenn up in the booth. Remember that whole storyline? where it was always like, well, you know, I can write things out and suggest and set it next to Tyler Bowen, and maybe he calls him that play, or maybe he doesn't. And uh, things did get a little better at that point. Not a, not a lot better, but, uh, like, they they did dominate that third quarter, and it was the best quarter Virginia Tech had of offense all year. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with all that. I, I, there, there's just not anybody outside of Holt with, like, offensive experience, a lot of offensive experience, uh at this level and you know he's running special teams like you can't expect him to take a huge role on x's and o's on offense when he's already trying to coordinate the special team efforts um so we wanted i wanted this year i, I said you know i don't think it was a great great working relationship last year between the three coordinators between the three offensive coordinators the guys with coordinator titles bowen glenn and rudolph and i, I didn't know Two I'm, of them I'm, are gone now. Uh, yeah, right. I, I didn't know how much of the of that. I, I, I think they got along, but I, I think from a coaching standpoint, there were differences. Uh, I don't know how much how much those differences. I didn't know how much those differences affected Virginia Tech's performance on the field. So I didn't know how much you could really judge Tyler Bowen. And I said, I want to be able to judge him. He's standing on his own two feet now. It's his offense. Now we'll know whether he's good enough. And I think we are finding out. I, yeah, I have a – while we're talking about just the coaching staff as a whole, I have a, a general question. This was asked, did Pry put too many eggs in the who can recruit basket versus the who can actually coach basket? Or did he assume that a lot of the coaching part would take care of itself? That's a good question. That's a great question. Re re rec recruiting is very, very important. Um, but at the same time, like at the coordinator positions, like Marv – when he when Marv was at Florida State, he was regarded as, some guy, as a guy who did – a pretty good job at recruiting, but they did, or excuse me, at coaching, but he, they didn't feel like he was a good recruiter at Florida State. So it's not like, you know, he's being leaned on heavily to like bring in a whole bunch. It's not like they're leaning on him like they leaned on Kavanaugh or Steinspring or like they're leaning on Mines. Um, I, I think like Mines has done fine as a coach and a recruiter. Derek Jones is really good at both. Um, He's also been doing it for a long He's time. He's been doing it for a long time. You know, like you said, there's more experience on the defensive side of the ball on, on no matter how you slice it. I, I I think coaching is the most important thing. And I know when Tech was going six six and six under Fuente, 
people had the opposite opinion. We need to get better players, and they just assumed the coaching would continue to be there. Obviously, now we know that's not the case, uh, that X's and O's and, and just pure experience and just being a good natural football coach is the most important thing. Like, like, do you really think, like, Kansas's recruiting is a whole lot different now than it, than it ever was? Like, no, they're just much better coached. And in that situation, that's a guy who came in and won two games in his first year, isn't very good. But then you see progress in the second year, and they win six games and make a bowl in the second year. And then this year they're 4-0. So you've seen steady progress, even though he got off to a bad start per se. He inherited a really bad situation, but he made it better in the second year. And you just you don't see that progress at Tech because I, I don't think there's enough uh, p- good, pure football coaches on, st- on this staff, at least not in the right positions. I think there, Sean Quinn's a good, pure football coach. I think Derek Jones is a good, pure football coach. Holt, Elijah Brooks, I think those guys are fine. I just don't think in the critical positions where Virginia Tech really needs real strong coaching acumen, they have what they need in those positions. Well, I think it's a balance when you're putting together a staff. You need to have guys who are competent in X's and O's, and you have to have guys that can go sell the program too. Because he, you know, you can be the the best X's and O's team out there and be refined, and we do everything right, and we have great schemes. And then if the other guy runs a four two and goes right past you, and you've got yeah. guys who are running four eights, you're not going to win many football games. And that catches up to you after a while. And that was an issue here. Uh, just the recruiting and selling the program in state and getting out there and, you know, trying to keep some of these guys closer and, and close to home on the recruiting trail. So, uh, you know, I think Pry has done a, a really good job on that aspect of it. It's the other side of it where I still have a lot of questions, obviously, with how they're operating. Is, is another question that comes up. I saw it on Twitter. Uh, some people said that, a Justin Fuente team would be four and zero or three and one right now with this CJ schedule. Carroll. What are, what yeah. are your guys coming over the top? CJ Carroll, former receiver. Uh, I don't think so. I don't th- <laughs> I'm inclined to disagree as well. First of all, we don't even know who the players would be right. because you know who who does he sign from the portal? Is it, how is that different than who pr- Pry signs? Just put it in, in a vacuum though, and saying he was the coach with these exact same players, I'm still going to disagree. I think they'd be. Two and two or three and one, but how many how many times in Fuentes' era did they win four consecutive games? Maybe three or four times in six years. Yeah, even that first year they'd have a couple wins in a row, and then like a just a random Georgia out of nowhere Syracuse Georgia Tech exactly like that. So the likelihood is they would have played an inconsistent game in there somewhere and lost it. I do think they would appear to be a better coach football team, and they'd have at least one more win. Well, I think. Fuente's strength always seemed to be in that opener. Yeah. He would, it, it, you give him an off season to prepare for something, or you give him time before a bowl game. I think they had some good plans going into bowl games, even though they didn't necessarily win all those games. Uh, I, I think he was a good game planner and could put together an excellent plan of attack on how to do it. Didn't always execute it the way you want. And I think there was you know, something left to be desired with some of his game management skills, as you saw in his last season there with the, the West Virginia ending the, you know, Notre Dame, Syracuse losing games that they shouldn't have lost down the stretch with a little bit better clock management. But uh, I think in terms of a game manager, yes, a little bit better from that aspect. But again, we don't know what kind of team he would have had because, you know, that was part of the issue was roster construction deficiencies in some eras, areas, I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, Stephen Gusnell might be playing quarterback if Fuente was the guy here. <laughs> uh, wide receivers playing quarterback. So uh, we don't know what the situation would have been like. I certainly don't think they would have been four zero because did they ever go four zero? And did they ever go unbeaten in their non conference schedule in their Fuente? I don't think they did. Yeah, I don't think they started four zero at any point. Certainly, did they? Because they lost to Tennessee that first year, That's that would right. have been their best chance. Uh, maybe they started four zero in twenty seventeen. It was Clemson the fourth or. F- Okay, they did. So Clemson was the fifth game. So, so yeah, they would have started four and but that's the only time I think that they would no, have started. Tech. Uh, no, they were four and zero in twenty seventeen. Okay, okay, they were twelfth in the country at that right, point. Right, right. Into that game, yeah. West Virginia, Delaware, East right. Carolina, Old Dominion. So yeah. I'm, I would say that it's unlikely that Tech would be four and zero. That's dull. But I do think they would appear to be. They would either be two and two or three and one, and they would appear to be a better prepared team. Like you wouldn't necessarily have as many complaints about the pure coaching, in my opinion. There'd be complaints. There'd be complaints, <laughs> but not as many. Yeah. So, so real- People would not accept the Brad Cornelson offense. Right. <laughs> Realis- realistically, right now, 
you know, if this was the NFL, you're going after year one. Like, what, how hot is the seat, whether it's the coordinators, whether it's Coach Pry, like you're getting to a point now you're one and three year two. I expect for uh, – now, Marv is a little bit different because he's only had five games, including the Liberty game last year, whereas Bowen, you've had, you know, a season and, and a third, and, and, you know, the evidence is pretty much added up. Uh, I guess the, the negative for Marv is now – They've actually gotten worse now that it's completely his defense and everything. So it's it's a concern. Um, I I expect Bowen's seat is extremely hot. Like you said it in your five thoughts. It's like it's something that that you've got to talk about now. And Brent Price said he does. He's not afraid of hard conversations. And I expect he's going to be having some. At some point, when I, I don't know uh, how. Uh, I mean, there's eight games left. Things could conceivably get better, but I mean, I, I think if you get to the end of the season and if things continue down this path and you show no improvement offensively, like he has no read of the fan base at all if they continue on this track and he doesn't do something about the offense. That's my take on that. Yeah, I mean, and I don't want to write the obituary on the season after four games. We're not even out of September yet. A lot can change over the rest of the year, but it's about progress. And are are you making incremental gains? Or is the plan starting to work and, and come into place as, as guys mature in the system? And uh, you know, if you know, we're we're gaming out how many wins can they have this year? Like three and nine is very possible. Two and ten is possible. Like I just look at the rest of the schedule and <laughs> yeah. I go, I mean, you can talk yourself into maybe winning three games, but or winning three ACC games, but you know, four and eight is not does not feel like progress. And if you go four and eight after going three and eight, can you just run it back? Can you just go? We're just going to stick to the same plan. We're going to keep going with that. Do you, do you have to make? You're going to have to bring in some, you know, some major changes on your staff and and shake things up and bring in some you know, ideally veteran voices that can maybe guide some of these guys along. Like I said, I think Bowen and Marv are both young, personable, good coaches. And I think Bowen on the recruiting trail, I can see why he's an effective recruiter like that. That's something you would want to keep on staff, but do you need to hire somebody that can sort of guide him along? You need a co-OC in some regards. Um, It's just, I feel like if if you go, three and eight, three and nine or four and eight, whatever it's going to be this year. Uh, potentially it's just tough to go. We're coming back next year with the same crew. That, that's just a tough thing to sell to people. Hey, David, as far as the, the, the crew is concerned, I want to go through and just give everybody a sense of what everybody's contract situation is. So there are two people with, or three people with contracts that expire after the 2024 season. That is Tyler Bowen, Chris Marv, and Stu Holt. Uh, Fontel Mines was extended. Um, so Fontel Mines, is, I, as far as I'm aware, is the, you know. You got another he, four? Is that? Yeah, I think he's, I mean, Fontel Mines is the longest. I'll go look it up in a second. He's I'm, not going anywhere. He's not way. going anywhere so. anytime <laughs> soon. But then you think of the other two holes on the, the other two guys on the offensive staff. Ron Crook was hired this spring. Elijah Brooks was hired this spring. So you've got two coaches that are here through 2024, one who's here longer, and then the other two who just signed. Defensively, it's a little bit different. Marv is here through three years, and then Derek Jones, J.C. Price, Pearson Prelu, and Sean Quinn, their contracts all expire this year. So there's... F- flexibility quote unquote if you want to call it that um the you know four four of those defensive contracts expire this year but it i think i'm looking at the offense and going like that is you know that's because brad glenn and joe rudolph left Mm -hmm. like you had to hire guys to replace them obviously but that means that you know most of your staff like like the staff hasn't even worked you look at a guy like Ron Crook and Elijah Brooks, they've only coached four games with this team, which is just kind of crazy to, to think about. But this is kind of the mess that Tech is in right now. Yeah, yeah. Con- contract says doesn't matter. At this point, it, it doesn't to- matter. If you have to buy somebody out, you buy them out. I mean, that's cheaper than buying think- out Brent Pry and $14 million. <laughs> yeah. If you have to make changes to your staff, like I said, I don't feel like it can be cosmetic. Uh, 
you know, again, we might be getting ahead of ourselves in this whole thing. We're kind of projecting of where the season might go at the end of the year. But, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, if you're the head coach and all of a sudden AD, other people are coming up to you and saying, well, your job's going to be on the chopping block if you don't start <laughs> making some changes. Uh, the loyalty goes out the window very quickly with these head coaches when it's like, oh, do I have to throw a coordinator over the bus to get this thing turned around a little bit? I will do that. But uh, those are smaller financial commitments that you have to make to a program that are necessary sometimes if things aren't working. And if you have to spend a little bit more on that front to, to get it changed, to get it right, then that's something you just have to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I don't think Texas assistance, like the regular assistance on offense are an issue. Like Ron Crook's offensive lines in the past – been good offensive lines and and they're showing also he got here in like like two right. seconds before spring ball right, right. began and, like I, I do not blame right. him for this offensive line situation this is these offensive line and, he inherited and to his credit those guys have gotten better each of the last two weeks we've they've gotten better and uh at least in run blocking so credit where credit's due his lines have got his, his have gotten a bit better um you know Stu Holt wherever he's been he's done fine you know there, there's not any issues there's not any evidence in the past that he's had coaching issues. Elijah Brooks had like two or three backs from Maryland go to the NFL. You know, he's, he's, he's shown the ability to be able to coach. I mean, I just, I don't think the offensive assistants are the issue. The, the only thing that I would, the only thing that would worry me is if they did change offensive coordinators and the new offensive coordinator came in and said, well, I want a new offensive line coach. Then you'd be on your fourth offensive line coach in four years. Right. And, mm -hmm. and nobody wants that. But that, that's well on down the road. We'll, we'll cross that bridge if and when we get there. All right. Two quick ones to wrap things up for today. Uh, do we have a QB one in Kyron Drones? Like so. So to explain my question, if Grant Wells was healthy coming into next week, who do you want under center? I don't care. I've said this from the very I don't. Like, I, I ran the numbers in my article yesterday. I ran the numbers in my article. Tech is a much better running football team with Kyron Drones. And they're a much better passing team with Grant Wells. They're two completely different quarterbacks. The result is the exact same so far. It's just a different route of getting there. Um, I, they will end up most likely picking drones, so in to, my opinion. Sort of because he's got ex, he's got more eligibility left. Like like Wells Wells technically does has his COVID year, but he's unlikely to to uh, to come back. I mean, he got married this past summer. I think he's probably you know yeah. graduate. You're married, probably ready to go on and, and live your life. So I think the ultimate choice will be drones. But I just, I, I I think you're. It's not going to matter all that much in the end. It's just going to look. I mean, you saw the passing game yesterday or Saturday and how limited it was. I mean, the, the passing concepts are so different with drones in there because he's not quite as advanced in, in, in the passing game. So you have to change the plan when he's in there. And it does limit the passing game. It gives you more in the running game. But in the, in the, at the end of the result, you're not scoring 20 points, which is pretty much what you're doing already before. So it just it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. You're, you're not going to win very many football games this year. I mean, the, the, the problems with Virginia Tech are so far ahead of whichever one of those guys starts at quarterback. And I'm in more, a lot more interested in solving that problem than I am that, that. Because I don't think either one of those guys, whoever is the quarterback, is going to get the most out of their ability. You know, and I defended Wells because I don't think he was well coached. And I'll defend Jones because I don't think he's well coached. Just you've got to solve that problem before you can expect any of your quarterbacks to play well. So I'll ask this question to Andy. You know, is there value in, okay, now we're not going to keep switching back and forth. Like, there's obviously some value in the run. We have that in Kyron Drones. Like, you're taking a step backwards if you go, okay, now we're going to pass the ball this week and put in Grant Wells, and then, like, oh, he gets banged up again. Now we got to go back to Kyron. Like, is there value <laughs> in the consistency of, like, having a game plan with one guy every week? You would think so, but I mean, you can see why they are tempted to play the two quarterbacks and why Pry thinks they have a two-headed monster at quarterback, which uh, I, I think he should, probably, words. he should probably retire that phrase. I don't think it's going to go over well with people. Uh, you know, they, they clearly pass it better with Wells. They clearly run it better with drones. And if you could merge those quarterbacks together, you'd have a pretty decent, I don't want to say good quarter, you'd have a decent quarterback out there uh, uh, playing behind center. But it's tough. I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I, I would probably lean more towards drones. Like Chris said, he's got more eligibility left. Uh, I think that's the way they want this offense to look more 
in terms of uh, a running quarterback can create things with his legs and make the defense account for things that they didn't before. Maybe a little bit more RPO uh, possibility with him with, when he's in the game. But uh, there's no perfect solution to this thing. And, and I guess, you know, another thing is if Ali Jennings continues to be out, you don't have the same passing group that you had against ODU where Wells looked pretty good firing it around and all of a sudden you have these all these weapons. I don't think Jalen Lane was quite himself the other game. I mean, he played, but I, I still don't know if he was all the way back from that hamstring thing. So, you know, maybe the weapons in the offense uh, push you towards drones being the guy just because it enhances the run game and that's the way you can do it. And, you know, if your defense is struggling, you'd like to be able to run the ball and, it, you know, Keep the other team off the field if you can sustain some drives. Ideally, uh, you think that would be a better way to do it. Last one for you here, fellas. Um, despite the loss, give me a couple of things where Virginia Tech took a step in the right direction. The running game when they actually decided to use it. Now, I'm not saying it was uh, consistent. They weren't out there getting five, six yards every carry, but they had chunk yardage in it. And, you know, that's the same. It was the same thing. Like, that, that's, that's how offense is. Like, teams don't go out there and, pick up seven yards exactly every play. I mean, like Marshall, I mean, they ran for a lot of yards on Virginia Tech, but they had, you know, a 61-yarder and a 56-yarder. I mean, that that's part of, of – you're not a good offense unless you break off chunk plays, you know. So Virginia Tech, I've, they've taken step forwards, even in the traditional running game with, with Tootin, you know, nine carries for 88 yards, you know, 9.8 yards per carry. I mean, you think about two games ago, he had 14 carries for four yards. So this is it's it's they've taken a massive step forward in in the running game and and I and I think uh, that's partially drones coming in but they're they're blocking better much better now so I, I think I think Crook deserves some credit here because I think they're off, the offensive line is executing a higher level now than it was two weeks ago for sure yeah you you mentioned the run game I think. Run defense for the majority of snaps. I didn't feel like like Marshall was just getting, you know, seven yards a carry or something like that. I mean, two carries accounted for half their yards, more than half their rushing yards. So there were a lot of times that they were stopping them close to the line or in the backfield. So if you can, I mean, it's it's like other than that, how is the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Like, <laughs> yeah, other than the two fifty yard runs, they didn't have terrible rushing defense in that game. Uh, I think if they can they can plug up those long runs and, and be in the right gap at times, that group can show vast improvement. Uh, I thought the Gaznell brothers were great as receivers. I mean, Benji had a couple catches on that last drive, uh, get him down the field. Steven made a great one-handed catch, uh, went up high for another one, and then got like Goldberg speared into the ground by the <laughs> Marshall defender. Drones did him no favors with how high that throw was, but I think both of those guys – uh, continued to contribute pretty well. And then, you know, they were down 14. They score a touchdown to get into it. They have another chance at the end to come in and tie it. Yeah, there is something to be said about the resiliency of this team. They they didn't completely fold at the end. I, I've seen teams completely fold. I've seen Virginia Tech teams completely fold when they get down before, and this team hasn't been like that. They fought back against Purdue. They fought back against Rutgers. They had it there at the end uh, against Marshall where they had a chance. Uh, you know, they get the the tough false start penalty there in fourth and one uh, coming out of a timeout, which is just brutal. I mean, that backs him up. All of a sudden it changes your play call. Uh, you don't have the chance to go in and win it there, but you know, they, they had a chance there and I would, it would have been interesting. I bet you I'm guessing probably would have gone for two. Had they scored the touchdown at the end I sure would have. on the road, you know, considering what your defense, I know they were playing better at the end there and getting some stops, but uh, you know, they had a chance to get back into it. So if you're a coach and you're looking for positives, those are some positive things that I think you can build on. David, anything else from you in the fourth chair? Oh, yeah, I got plenty. Um, I, I have a question <laughs> for you guys. If you take out uh, – I, I did numbers. You want to guess what Marshall's uh, yards per carry was if you take out all these two giant plays of 50 or more yards? 2.6. 3.5. Yeah. 2.3. So Marshall had less than 100 yards if you subtract Ollie's two big rushings, which just goes to show you that I would say you could argue that Virginia Tech's making small strides there. And I think, to your point, Andy, you look at the... Uh, if you look at, like, Marshall's drive chart, like, the last, Marshall's last... Four, I'm not counting the one that where they just took a knee to end it out... After Marshall scored a touchdown, Marshall's last four drives, 
offensively, Tech picked them off, and that was a good interception by Keonta Jenkins. And then Tech forced three punts, two of which were three and outs. Mm -hmm. It's just there's no consistency there. Well, you know, you have to project ahead. And the previous week, Ali, at the beginning of the, or at some point in the fourth quarter, had 15 carries for six yards against East Carolina. And then he finished with 18 for 85. I mean, this is a guy who hits big plays. That's what he does. That's been the Marshall offense so far. But basically, the Marshall offense has been really bad so far this year. They were slightly above average overall against Virginia Tech, which means they got better going against Virginia Tech. You know, so, so yeah, it seems like it was okay because Marshall only had a slightly above average overall game offensively, but that's because they're just not very good offensively. So it's not good from Tech's standpoint. At some point, Tech is going to start facing a few quarterbacks that can actually play. Cam Fancher is not very good. His his numbers last year were well below par. And if you know, in this game he wasn't very good. Two turnovers. Should have had another. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Monsoor had that one yep, pretty ex- weak exactly pass right. interference call, in my opinion. Officiated it didn't feel like big game officiating. No. In no, that one. No. I thought that, that Dorian Strong pass interference was pretty weak. Right. Watching it, it's like, well, yeah. he's trying to come back. It's like sort of half-heartedly trying to come back to get the ball. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how Monsoor dropped that one. That was a layup oh, of an man. interception. Really that would have been such a tide-turning play. Uh, the Tisdale roughing at the end. I know he can't get anywhere near the quarterback and even make it a, a situation where the refs could throw a flag on that play. But he came over the top of him. He didn't yeah. even hit him, really. Uh, that was a little questionable. And then on that, uh, it was a block in the back on Tucker Holloway's uh, punt return, which... I don't know. He was behind him, but I don't know if he actually like blocked him or if the guy just kind of tripped on that one. Those are three calls that I look at and I go, I could see you throwing the flag, but it's still, I don't know if they needed to in those, those situations. It's probably accurate. Cheating refs. That's what I've, it is. I've, we've got, we got <laughs> Tristan Raish uh, breaking down the, the call in Tisdale this week. Mm. Okay. So should, should I'd be, be curious his thoughts on the, the PI on Dorian. Yeah. yeah. Cause I didn't think, that was a pretty critical one because the next play after that was the sixty-one yard by That's sixty-one right. yard run You're by right. Ali. You're right. So instead of punting out of their own end zone, or if Monster could have caught that potentially, I mean, they could, that, that might have been a pick six if he catches that thing. Yeah. Instead, it's the PI first down. They break a big run. They get a touchdown. They're up two scores. Yeah. You're right. Pretty significant turning point in that game. It was. Um, so yeah, there were some tough plays, but you know, in general, like at some point, Tech's going to face some some better quarterbacks than they faced so far. So you've got an the Tech has had an advantage in that Marshall's one dimensional, Rutgers is one dimensional, um, Old Dominion is kind of proving to be no dimensional. They scored. Is 10, Hudson Card the best quarterback they've played absolutely, so far? Absolutely, not even close. Wow. Yeah, and Harrell I think is the best offensive coordinator that, that they faced. And low bar. Right, right, right. I don't so, know if it's going to be cleared by Phil Drakovic. Well, it was Pitt not right. <laughs> correct. <laughs> and then I'm not even. I'm going to throw out Florida State too because they're they're well ahead. I'm not going to judge them on that. But you know, you're you're going to face Schrader at some point. Uh, you're going to face Brennan Armstrong, and he hadn't having a great year. But that's more about. I don't think they have any skill position talent. But uh, the main point I'm trying to make here is you ain't going to face Cam Fancher every week from here on out. You know, you're going to Tech is going to have to get significantly better defensively. Where's that? Where's that? Oh, go on. I mean, Tech, what are they, second in the country in pass defense? Well, nobody said to throw the ball on them. Exactly. I mean, they have a, they have a good pass defense. But they do. I think. They do. But I agree. But at some point, you're going to play somebody with more balance. And that's when you're really going to have to be a lot better than Tech has been so far. David, I got two questions for you guys. What short-term fix area improvement do you think could be addressed to win a few games? I would say turnover margin, but, you know, Tech actually did win the turnover margin this past week where they had lost it the previous two weeks. Two Um, to one, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, fix the run defense. I mean, if you could stop the run just averagely, just averagely, then 16 of 27 for 166 yards and two interceptions is not going to beat you. Right. And it, it, the issues there seem like wrong gap fitting. Like, go to the right gap. That, that's a mental thing. That's not like, uh, oh, we're just overwhelmed physically. And there might be some of that going on defensively. But it's, you know, don't have two guys run to the same gap. That's a mistake that you can fix uh, through reps and through teaching and through practice. And uh, like you mentioned, you know, the, you take away the two big plays. No, you can't. That's football. <laughs> and those two big plays count. They did pretty well stopping the run other than that. So, uh I don't know if that's a quick fix or an easy fix, but is a fix that would make a world of a difference if they could improve there. I'll, I'll be interested to see, because they, they put balance in the game, George balance in the game. And I think when you put your number three, Mike, or actually he's been 
they've used three mics before that game, and then they put throw him in there, and I guess that makes four for, for the season. So he's a true freshman walk on. I think that shows that they're extremely unhappy with their other players that position. They might come out and say, "Oh, Tisdale's done this and Tisdale's done that," but no, the mics are playing poorly. There's not a natural mic on there. Nobody at that position is good at stopping the run. Besides Aeson Stevens, who's a true freshman and who's redshirting <laughs> yeah. with a torn ACL, Balance is the only natural inside linebacker on this team. All these other guys were safeties in high school. Like even Will Johnson was like a safety in high school. That's Sometimes that works. Like Tyreen Powell at Rutgers was a safety, and he's a good linebacker for Rutgers. But I don't think your top four inside linebackers can be high school safeties. Right, that's probably a low percentage chance of getting good linebacker play. I, I think they're going to increase balances snaps. Oh, I have a, I have a. Question. It sounds like the playing time there is sort of a balancing. Act. Yeah, it's a nice balancing act. My only, if compl- I had the the David Caruso sunglasses, I would have taken them off. I, 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 I included balance uh, in, in my article yesterday, and the thing that's really annoying me is every time I type balance, it auto corrects it. it oh, it's a one L. L. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a question about balance. Uh, what are the things that are limiting him from getting more reps, and why isn't he considered a scholarship type player? He looked apart against Marshall physically. How does he stack up against the current group? Yeah, uh, I, I guess the first things you're concerned about is you know pass coverage. But honestly, who cares? Stop the run. It's a middle linebacker. That's you. That's your most important job. Um, if, if coverage becomes an issue, then okay, you'll try to address that, but only after you get the run defense fixed. Um, and I, I think. Ultimately, he's only a true freshman, and uh, the re- I don't know how many camps he went to out of high when he was in high school and things like that. So that that, that could be an issue with the starters and things like that. And we don't even know that like that he's going to be like a really good long term answer or anything like that. He played four snaps the other Correct. day. Correct. It's a very small sample size, um, but I, I do think you know Tisdale's gone after this year. You just haven't seen progress from Jaden Keller. I know they keep saying that he has. You hear that every year. Keller's made progress, and then the game start, and he hasn't. I mean, but it's not – even if you go back and look at his high school tape from his senior year, there's like two defensive plays on it. The rest of his offense. Um, it's, it's almost like they've taken like a wide receiver or running back and say, here, play middle linebacker. But that's probably not going to work. So a guy like Balance, I, I think he just brings more natural instincts to the position. Now, he's got three games left before they have to make a decision on a red shirt because that was his first game this past week. Um, I, I do – he gray shirted, so, which means I think he was class of 2022, then sat out and then enrolled in January. So if they red shirted him this year, at one point down the line, he could be like a sixth year, six years out of high school, middle linebacker, knows exactly what to do, just kind of type of player tech football was 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 built on to a certain extent. Um so I, selfishly, I want to redshirt him for the future, but at the same time, <laughs> if he earns the right to play, then 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 play him. But if you play him, actually play him. Don't be like, oh, we'll give him seven snaps here, and we'll put him on the kickoff team, and he can just watch the ball sell out of the end zone, right? That doesn't help anybody's development. If you're going to burn a redshirt, get them significant snaps. And, and I would get him significant snaps in practice this week, and if he does a good job, then significant snaps in the game. I need. You, I think you want to find out exactly what you have, so you can make the best decision going forward. And you know, four snaps isn't enough. Is it's not enough. But I, I haven't seen enough improvement from those other players. I haven't seen any improvement from those other players, to be quite honest with you. So, uh, at some point, you want to give somebody else an opportunity if they're showing it in practice that they deserve the opportunity. Well, he's shown enough to that they throw him out there for four snaps in a game. So that's a start. So I think it's uh, time to go ahead and continue that experiment a little bit because at this point I just I'm, I'm not holding out hope for any of those other guys at the mic spot. I just don't think there's enough natural linebacking ability there. I think there's good athleticism, but there's a big difference between really good athleticism and being a really good linebacker. Uh, I would I was going to start this question. This is the last question I have. I was going to start this question with Andy, but Andy's tweeting out that the Virginia Tech Florida State game is a 3:30 Eastern kickoff. Um, on ABC, on ABC or ESPN. Oh, um, Chris, big picture. If you were appointed GM of the Virginia Tech football program right now, what would you do? Like, what? Like, is there something like you? I mean, obviously, I feel like you have to like 
experience, you know, see the in the, the what's going on behind the scenes for a little bit, sit in on stuff, see how it's currently going and figuring out how sure. to change it. But, but is there anything that stands out to you? Like, man, I think I'd probably fix that. R- really? Oh my gosh. We, we need another hour for me to talk about <laughs> all this, but, uh, and I'm not saying all these things are for sure, but just the easiest ones, so to speak, like, I don't think tech is up to snuff with the coordinator positions. Uh, I would change that. Um, I, I would really try to bring in an old head who has a lot of experience and can just see how tech does things on a daily basis um, and, and see if there needs to be any changes there. Um, you know, Wit, Wit himself has, has never made like what most people would consider to be a successful foot hire, football hire. Fuente has been his best hire at whatever school he's been at. And Fuente was 43 and 31 and got fired. So like Fuente wasn't like a huge, huge failure, but he wasn't a success either. Um, I think Witt needs an associate AD for football, someone who is used to being a football administrator and really knows the sport. You know, in the past, Tech has had athletic directors that were football guys. Like Jim Weaver was a former football coach. He knew what to look for. He knew what football coaches need needed. He knew he could walk in there into a staff meeting and see, know that those guys knew what they were talking about and things like that. I think the same thing for Dave Brain. You know, he had a lot of experience with, with football and Wit doesn't. I think there needs to be another athletic director uh, on that staff under Wit that takes direct control of the football program and go to Wit and say, okay, here's what I'm seeing and this is what needs to happen. And, uh, I just don't think there's anybody overseeing the football program that, that's that's really capable of making the, those types of decisions. So, you know, th- there's a couple things all, all off the top of my head. Um, maybe a few others here and there that I don't want to say on a podcast, public <laughs> podcast. But, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there you go. I especially think, you know, you need somebody in there that knows football. It has a ba- strong background in football to oversee that thing. Last but not least, guys, what's coming up on uh, TSL this week? Our normal content, Gio. Uh, you know, we've actually, Tristan's already sent in his article. I'll run that tomorrow. I assume Will's working on Monday Thoughts. I'm going to get to work on my pit preview. Early preview on pit. They're awful offensively, arguably worse than Virginia Tech, depending on which stat you want to hang your hat on. Mm-hmm. But the difference is they're, they're, they're still a pretty good defensive team. So you're not looking at a very... Very high-scoring game on Saturday night on paper. I feel like struggling pit offenses have gotten healthy against Virginia Tech in the past. Maybe not here. Maybe not in Lane <laughs> Stadium necessarily. Uh, definitely up at Hines, Acrisher, whatever they're calling it now up there. Uh, we'll see with my coverage. We, we don't even know who's coming to the press conference yet tomorrow. So it's kind of up in okay. the air about that. But I, I'll have a mailbag this week. I haven't done one in a couple of weeks. Definitely get that out there. Cool. We've got a lot of good stuff coming. Jack Brizen 9 has a wrestling story I'm going to publish uh, later this afternoon. Um, I'm actually sitting down with Rodney Rice later this afternoon. I'm going to have a feature on him coming out this week. Men's and women's basketball schedules come out tomorrow night, nice. Tuesday, just to give everybody something new to focus on, uh, something new to complain about if you're that type of person. Um, yeah, so there, there's going to be a bunch of other stuff this week that's not football, so that's good. Cool. We're also doing a uh, Triumph Spotlight later today with Tucker Holloway. That will go out on Wednesday, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, final thoughts, guys, before I let you go. Any, anything you want to hammer home? So I asked you all this question last week. What's the over-under on wins at the end of the season? Would you change your pick now after one what more? Did I, oh, well, I think what I said I four, say? so yeah, I'm going lower I, than that. What did I tell you, Chris? Uh, 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 I know, two and a half. You're two right. and a half, I think, is right. <laughs> I, I, said, I, think that's so I, would, I said three and a half. No, I think you're right, David. I would put it at two and a half. <laughs> I would not change mine. I think two and a half. Well, you probably. look at the rest of the, the ACC schedule, the only games you can feel good about competitive being competitive in are probably Virginia and B.C., and everybody out, you know, Wake Forest has struggled a little bit. NC State offense, I mean, they barely beat Virginia last week. I fell, was, fell know, asleep the at the end of that game. game. But, but I'm talking go- about bad penalties at the end of the game. Virginia, so holy cow. Um, but, you know, even you look at Virginia, like, they've got some bravado. I'll give Anthony <laughs> Calandria that. The kid's got confidence. I don't know if it's founded in anything, but he goes out there and plays like he's a Super Bowl MVP uh, throwing those passes deep. So it's, it's, <laughs> that's a team that at least has confidence in BC. It's up at BC. And, you know, not a great history recently up at Chestnut Hill. So, I mean, it's just, you look at the schedule, it's tough to find wins in there. So, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say two and a half amazingly might be the number. Even, 
even some of the games where you feel like you can see the possibility for an upset, like this week against Pitt. And even it's in, definitely a chance. Even yeah, it's not right. great. And and even NC State and Wake Forest, you're like, okay, those teams are very average in a lot of ways, and you could see a path to victory. But at the same time, you're talking Pat Narduzzi, Dave Clawson, Dave Doran, mm. very experienced, proven football coaches who have won a lot of games in their careers. So, and in Pitt's case, like you know, this is going to be a brawl. <sighs> you know, it's going to be a fist fight yeah. of a game because it always is. Yeah, Tech's, when these teams play, and I just don't know if Virginia Tech suited to play that kind of game. Yeah, it's like I would say from a physicality standpoint, Tech and Marshall kind of drew. It was a draw. But in Tech's first three games, I don't know that you could say they were the most physical. I know you can't say they were the most physical team in any of those three games. And you're going to be playing Pitt, and that's Pitt's strength as a program. Pitt's like almost like a Big Ten team in some ways when it comes to all that. Yeah. Um, well, Narduzzi was a Michigan State guy before right. he came to he Pitt. Was. so No doubt. All right, well, appreciate you guys. We will uh, come at you on Thursday with another podcast where we will preview the Pitt Panthers. That will be in Lane Stadium, 8 p.m. kickoff on the ACC Network. We'll see you guys on Thursday. That wraps things up for episode 314 of the Tech Sideline Podcast.